Okay, we can get started. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to World Hoppers, the channel where we gather a bunch of different booktubers of all different types fantasy, sci-fi, romance, anything. Um, we, we've really expanded into a variety of genres here. And we do uh, long videos that you can listen to. It's like, kind of like a podcast in the background while you're driving to work or doing other things. Um, and all the AdSense revenue does go to charity. So make sure to watch those ads and go check out our merch because all of that profit also goes to charity. So all of that will be linked down below. I believe we have had everyone here on the World Hoppers channel before, so you'll see some familiar faces. Everyone's channels will be linked down below. But today, our video is going to be reacting to assumptions about the fantasy genre. So over on Instagram, Jess from Jess Owens and Elle, uh, they asked a bunch of their followers, what do you assume about the fantasy genre? And they've gathered all those responses, sent them to me, and we're going to react to them today. I've not shared them at all. I've tried not to really look at them myself um, more than I have to because we really want to just react raw to these assumptions. <laughs> And we're, we're going to have comments on them, I'm sure. So I, I feel like there's a bunch of like categories of assumptions. So I'm going to try to kind of categorize. I thought you didn't look at them, Jesse. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, said I had to, okay? All right. So I'm going to start with like what I feel like is a very, very common assumption. And that is <laughs> the stories are confusing and long. <laughs> I mean, they're not totally sometimes. wrong. Sometimes, but honestly, I mean, when you see like fantasy books in the bookstore and you see like Brandon Sanderson, you're like, yeah, fair. Those are very fair. long. Yeah. But I would say like it's it's a bad book if it's confusing. A good book is complicated and long. Agree. Yes, but the author has to do it well so that we can understand yeah. the <laughs> their job. They're like your fantasy Sherpa, and it's their got job to guide you through this world and this story. And if you're like, what is happening? That's a bad Sherpa. Yes, I completely agree. And that's honestly a lot of the fantasy books that tend to not work for me are ones that I do find too confusing or too. Ruin bad. of Kings. <laughs> Ruin of Kings. You know, some people like it. So there is a book for everyone in the fantasy genre, truly. But yeah, I, I don't like the confusing fantasy books. I like more like straightforward <laughs> storytelling. And I don't like having well, to like figure out. I, I think it's the same with like every genre. Like every yeah. genre, genre will have books that are super long and probably ones that are confusing. Like not necessarily just fantasy. It just yeah. depends on. Like, I think also. Really, I mean, with that, with really that assumption, I think people have conflated length with confusion. Like if it's long, therefore it must be like convoluted mm. and confusing, which mm. isn't necessarily the case. Sometimes a short book is very confusing, and a long book is very straightforward. So <laughs> that's true. I I agree with that fully, as I've been reading a lot of novellas this month, uh, and some of them confused me way more than any long book that I've read. Well, I feel like with a novella, I feel a lot of stress, because I'm like, with a long book, I'm like, eventually, this will probably make sense. With a short book, I'm like, it's still not making sense, and you only have pages left. <laughs> what is going on? Yeah. That is me all, week, all month. I, I agree. Yeah. And I will say, like, with the length, a really good fantasy book is one that makes me forget how long it is like mm -hmm. when i'm so enthralled in like the world and you have to think like fantasy books just inherently have to be a little bit longer right because you're introducing an entirely new world to the reader so you have to kind of orient them in that world whereas like other genres you don't have to do that you don't have to tell us what world you're in you're in our world so right. <laughs> i feel like if it's not long i'm typically like my reaction is well, I, I wanted more because I wanted to like dive even deeper into this imaginary world that was so brilliantly in your head. I want to I want to explore that more. Um, but the, my, the good ones are the ones that make me forget how long it is. My yes. mom likes to complain about things that don't affect her at all. Um, and so, <laughs> for example, she reads no fiction whatsoever, not even not fantasy, just like no fiction at all. Um, but nevertheless, she was like, oh, why are fantasies always series? And I'm like, I don't know why this affects you at all because you don't read. <laughs> But like she is always, why is it always a series? Ugh. And I'm like, well, if you've bothered to build this entire world, mm -hmm. it feels like a little bit of like a waste to like, well, let's do a few more stories there because I built the thing. So like, <laughs> let's use the set a couple more times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
really nicely into this assumption. <laughs> you have to get at yes. least three long books to get a conclusion. At least, at yes. minimum. <laughs> Although they're not going to disagree fully. I mean, there are some really good standalone ones. But there are also series where, like, it is a series, but it is, like, a series of, not standalones, but, like, each yeah. one is more episodic. Yeah. I like those. I like those. Yeah. But, again, I think with the fantasy books that I truly love, I, like, want to be in the world longer. So I want <laughs> more books in that world with those <laughs> yeah. characters. And that's kind of not the same with other genres. And that's why I like fantasy, because I, I want to be in those worlds that I love. Uh, so it's well, like, I feel I, like I, a long, I, yeah. a long series, just like a long book um, has to know how to keep you like give you some amount of satisfaction and conclusion throughout so that you're not just like waiting and waiting and waiting. And like, there's literally no payoff until the end, because there can yeah. like the ultimate like the con like, oh, absolute like you know, the, it is the end game of this series. But each mm -hmm. like Marvel movie has its own arc and its own like, yeah, um, conclusion and its own climax and whatever and like new information that you're like, aha, wow, new revelation. So like, if a series truly gives you nothing until the end, like, I don't, if you can like it, I don't know your life. But I would be like, that's a bad series because it should like, you know, it, it should keep you for that ultimate question that you're like, that's what I'm really here for. I want to see the end of that. But in the meantime, that was a good arc. That was a good arc. Yeah. That was a good arc. Yeah. And I think you can generally tell, like, if a series that's been plotted from the beginning, like, North goes, I know this series is going to be six books. And so you can see that end game from the beginning or maybe not from the first book but like from the second third but you can see where they're definitely heading and then you get the books where or the series where it started off as a trilogy and then suddenly they're making it into a six book series because <laughs> it's making the money yeah or because the author just cannot be stopped from writing more and more and more they're like i'm gonna have to like expand and they don't this have an bit. editor and it's just so much filler <laughs> and then at that point, it becomes a bit annoying that it's so long. Seems like you have a serious mind, Abby. <laughs> I know. Song of Ice and Fire you, comes you, to mind. You were able to guess that? Yeah, yeah, I can guess which one that is. And we've reached the part of the stream where I bring up Joe Abercrombie. Uh, <laughs> I do. What is Man, that? that only You're took, what, seven minutes? Seven minutes. minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so, like, I actually would say, and I think he would agree that he kind of messed up the first time he wrote a trilogy because he was like, well, I kind of thought it's, like, one story and then you kind of have to wait until the end, like, mm. and, like, it's understood. Like, wh why are you dissatisfied when the first one didn't give you the answer? This is a trilogy. He was like, understandably, like, in <laughs> retrospect, not, not, I get it, like, not the best strategy, but mm. also, like, the opposite of, like, the, what Abby was complaining about, authors, like, that write more and more and, and stretch their series. He always writes his stories. Like that's why in his head it's one story because he writes his trilogy in one draft. And then oh. it's like, I know where this ends. And then as they re are released, you know, he edits it and like polishes it up before it's going to be published, but he's not like writing it as he goes. So he's like, this is the story. So it's never that like, what if it's longer though? <laughs> <laughs> but what if, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one kind of, kind of is on a similar topic to what we've been talking about it's too difficult to follow all the characters and world building this is why i like a character list yes uh, or like a glossary i love, I love a glossary like Thank you. i'm currently reading the hunger of the gods and when i opened that book and saw the character list i was like <laughs> there are <laughs> there are some there books there wasn't a character list in the shadow of the gods no there and, wasn't although there was only three povs there was a lot of side characters within those povs and it, there was a lot of people in that book so it was really lovely to get a character list i was like this is what i need there are a couple books that have made me laugh with like of the first page you know before the story starts that says like dramatis personae and gives you like a very dramatic <laughs> character list that i'm like i mean lol but also kind of helpful right <laughs> I also the pronunciation love a guide, please. I love a good recap. Like when you're in the second yeah. movie series, I love, I love a good recap. That's what Hunger so of the Gods far. is doing. Hunger of the Gods did that as well. I was like, this, yeah, you, this is needed. That. Yeah, this definitely needed. I didn't know that they did that. I haven't read that one yet. Well, there are also it's so like I sitting there. There's two ways. To, sometimes they'll have a literally like a page that's kind of like the character list. That's like before we start, here's a quick one pager to like catch up on where we've been at. And then there's other authors who just like build into the first couple chapters a lot of like, and as you recall, 
xyz mm -hmm. happened you're like oh yes it did uh, oh, yeah. i forgot <laughs> about that thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i i to be honest i kind of have to agree with this assumption for a lot of books and i think as i've been reading more fantasy i've just come to realize that you have to you have to stick with it for a while before you really have a good grasp on your cast of characters if it's like multi-perspective right mm -hmm. i'm thinking of malice by john gwen i had to stick with that book for like at least 200 pages i know we have some malice haters <laughs> <laughs> stream but i i did i oh. i was like i don't know what's going on I don't know who these characters are. I don't understand anything. And I, I, it was like a good 200 pages into that book before I was like, oh, that's who that guy is. Okay. <laughs> well, like, you kind of have to like give it time um, for for some of those like multi-perspective well, stories. I, see, I actually uh, I don't use glossaries. I, don't, I, think, I so, think we said like, this about length, but like it's not only fantasy that has a lot of characters. And like, I mean, a historical uh, book yeah. would have like not world building in the same way, but it were like mm -hmm. orienting yourself in the time. Mm -hmm. And there can be like historic epics that like have a ton of like generations of characters mm -hmm. that you have to. So like, it's not only fantasy that can have yeah, this problem. True. And I think as well, it can depend if it's a series and if it, there's been a large chunk of time since you read previous installments yeah. within that series, um, because it can definitely be easier to follow a story if you're reading the series back to back. Whereas if it's been a year, two years between reading the previous book, definitely it can get very confusing between who yeah. the characters and the world yeah. building and the plot events are. Yeah, right. I've, I've stopped trying to even do that. I'm like, I, I can only like binge series now because I just... <laughs> lose so much of it in between and it's 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 so but, I, I can agree i can see this assumption like i i get it I but also too. just like with the like confusion assumption like it's also like a bad author that writes so many characters that are not distinct to you with like 10 different names that you're like i don't know who these people are like i can't keep track because like a good author should like you should be able to like get a feel for the character and know who they are and like be able to keep track or when or when all the characters have super similar names yeah. And like they look very similar to And they have like, like ten why? titles and ten nicknames and you're yeah. like <laughs> But wait, why do they all start with like the same three letters? Like what yeah. they all end with the same thing. Like I is this this person? Like so th that definitely comes into play. Which leads really nicely into this. Too many characters. World, <laughs> too many dang characters. <laughs> yeah. I mean I, I think we already kind of commented on on this one, but yeah, I mean I I can agree. The world building is tedious and excessive piece of this assumption though. We haven't really commented yeah. on. And I think it depends on your preference as a reader. Because some readers mm -hmm. really like I getting every detail. Yeah. Like you we some character like or some readers want all of that. Even maybe if it even doesn't pertain to like the plot and moving the plot forward. Like just getting even more immersed in the world is fun. I personally like a little less world building and just more like only what's relevant to like keep the plot moving forward. But, but it's I can, also I can like how it. it's yeah. how it's delivered to the reader. Yeah. Yeah. Like info yeah. dumps versus yeah. organically yeah. weaving it in where like you're learning about it as you go in a way that doesn't mm -hmm. feel like pause, let me explain the world to you. Okay, back right. Back to and you're like, Ugh. Right. Yeah. Or to me, like I have read some where it's like, why do we have 17 pages of description about something that I do not care about? Yeah. Like yeah. we don't need this. <laughs> I don't need this. Like it doesn't seem important. Like yeah. I get it. That's you when you can make... include like an, a glossary <laughs> appendix world of like, yeah, include extra material. Yeah. That's like, if you're interested, here's how yeah. this thing mm -hmm. works. But there, yeah. there's some that definitely go like way too far like this. Well, it feels like the other like, I, is I thought of this thing and long. by golly, you're going to learn about this thing <laughs> that I thought of. Yes, you were going <laughs> to read this because I made it up. Yeah. I, um, I will say like, I feel like with these assumptions, like they're very accurate about certain fantasy books, but there are certain fantasy books that right. are, are different. Like there, I feel like there's such a wide range now of yeah. fantasy, like for mm -hmm. every reader in every type of sub genre of fantasy. So it's all of like what, what your preference is. Mm -hmm. um, this one's interesting. The world building will have tons of holes and then 
also investing so much time just to be disappointed at the end. It depends on the like the author that you pick. Yeah. Me, like certain authors. If it has it, holes. It's a bad holes. book. Yes, I was gonna say, Leanne, if it has holes, that many holes. Have holes. It just yeah. depends who does it right. And yeah. I think it depends if the world building is like a focal, like if it's like a character yeah. within the story. Because mm-hmm. I think they say that world building is in itself sort of like a character that you have to build up. Um, but it depends what you want to focus on. Like the house in the Cerulean Sea, there's literally like no world building in that. So I'd probably yeah. say it does have lots of holes in, but that's not what that story is going for. Mm-hmm. That story is more character focused. Um, that's such a good one too. And then you have like more plot focused ones. And then you do have ones which really focus on the world building. Yeah. And I think that there is like also a difference of like hard versus soft magic and how that could potentially introduce like plot holes. Like with the hard magic systems, it's assumed that there's a consequence or there's a limit to to the use of magic. And Mm -hmm. so if you're not following that magic system that's been established, that's a plot hole. Like all of a sudden you can't just like back out of it right like right. you have to stick except for the- it works differently because the plot needed it to so yeah. <laughs> except for like you can't do this you can't do this you can't do this main yeah. character all of a sudden can do the thing that's special yeah. because, right. because they're yeah. special like, right i think of like when i think of that <laughs> but i feel like i mean well, i'm an extremely dragons. nitpicky reader <laughs> and i still love fantasy so like there's there are fantasies that can satisfy even the most nitpicky that's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is true. And but I do feel like soft magic systems kind of allow a little bit more um, leniency with yeah. uh, whether or not you could have plot holes because I mean you don't know the limits of a soft magic system. You don't yeah, know. Well, I feel it's... like too. Um, a lot of times when I've seen like you know like sort of discussion deep dive type videos about like so what's the difference between hard and soft magic? When can you use it? Can you use it? Like is it always bad to have soft magic? And like usually like a story that has soft magic it cannot and should not the plot should not like hinge on the magic because like the magic mm-hmm. doesn't have established rules and so then like if the plot is hinging on that then like you don't really know what we're doing here and then you can make it up as you go along and that removes tension and that creates holes. Whereas if, like if, you know, like Lord of the Rings is often used as an example of like a great use of soft magic because like mm-hmm. it's a soft magic yeah. system, but like most of what's going on doesn't hinge on magic. It's like the mm-hmm. characters and this the wars mm-hmm. and like magic can be like a small part of that that is kind of like, it's like a spice, but like you're the main dish here isn't magic. If your main dish is magic, it needs to be more than spice. <laughs> right. <laughs> I agree. I do agree with that. Um, Investing so much time just to be disappointed. This is a real concern. Yeah. Right? Especially if you're checking out like a new release of a Mm, new series where you don't have reviews to go off of to tell you like, is the end of this series going to be disappointing or is it going to be beloved? Like I knew going into the Lightbringer series that that fifth (laughs) book was not universally loved. A lot of people do not like the fifth book. I didn't mind it. I think my expectations were set, but that's a real thing. Like, Mm -hmm. am I going to go through all these books just to be disappointed at the end? But they're not necessarily saying that it's at the end of a series that's disappointing. They might just mean it's a long book and it's like, you have to invest so much time and be disappointed. Because like, I can think of like the poppy war. I loved the first two and then Mm -hmm. that ending of the last one was like, disappointing yeah it was disappointing like i still love the wah. series but but that last book i was like but why yeah i feel like picking up any book that's just a risk to it because yeah. you never know if you're going yeah. to like it. you're going to be disappointed with it if you're going to love it so i feel like there's the risk you know you just gotta go for it and see what well, i feel like that's why you have reviewers yeah. and that's why you have to get good at knowing your own taste and like knowing Definitely. very quickly if this is working for you or not so you can dip yeah. out early if you're like this is never gonna work for me i'm done <laughs> right, I'm out. Yeah. big proponent of dnfing if you don't like it yeah yeah i i do i do agree like with that assumption but yeah i could see how that's just a risk no matter what mm-hmm. um yeah and if you're okay. just getting disappointed by a book and you're like 200 pages in then you can step away that's or true. like you at any point in the book you step away. Away. <laughs> and that's also where like i think in 100 pages in you could be 95 percent finished and step away 
Well, and this yeah. like gets into like why negative reviews are important because like if you're feeling a certain kind of way about a book and like you find a negative review that agrees with that, then you can also look to that same reviewer who clearly has the same problems that you do. Not necessarily always. Like it doesn't mean it's a guarantee that what they like you'll like. But if they seem to have the same issues as you do with a book, then if they say another book is great, then you're like, well, it's not going to do that at least. So like <laughs> that might be a good option. <laughs> Exactly. I agree. The power of I thought this was funny because it's true. Audiobooks are great for this. Audiobooks are great for this. Just use that. Yeah, audiobooks are great. I, I completely agree with this. Literally, sometimes while I'm reading it, like, in my head, because I can't do audiobooks. I cannot absorb them correctly. I, my brain just goes, nope. So I will literally time? just like make up and just be like, okay, that's the character that starts with K or B. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I just skim it. But there's skim also that some name. series where the names are so fun that like if you do like get them right, like it's like I find that I want to say them when I talk about the book. Yeah. Like I don't actually need to tell you the name of the character to tell you what I'm trying to tell you, but I want to work it I in. Wanna say it. To what, yeah. Like it's a fun, like I don't really like Dune very much. Like I think it's okay. But the names in Dune for like the places and the stuff and the, you know, like those are such like namey names that I'm like, <laughs> let me, like, I don't need to say it, but like, I'm just going to say it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> namey names. And, and the main like, character's name is Paul. <laughs> so, like, right. Like, oh, I, I didn't mean that, that part. <laughs> we have a Paul and a Jessica. And <laughs> yes, but Paul is the Kwisatz Haderach, which like, that's the fun right. part. Well, <laughs> that is fun. <laughs> But it's like we did the Daughter of the Forest live show, and I still Sorka, don't think I can say the main Sorka? character's name right. No idea. Sorsha, Sorka, so, so. Well, I mean, Sorka? if you look at any people talking about King Killer Chronicle, no one agree about how to talk, how to pronounce Kvoth. Even though, oh, yeah, like, no. the book does have a pronunciation explanation at one point where they're like, it's Kvoth, like, it rhymes with uh, Quoth, like, Quoth the Raven. And so then some people think that means that his name is pronounced quoth, like the literal word. And I'm like, no, I think it means that it's like rhymes with it, like quoth. And then there's people say clothe and like, no I've not agrees. heard that one. <laughs> I kind of like that one. It that reminds fancy. me of like the, the Finding Nemo. It's a scuppy. A scuppy. <laughs> That's funny. Um, spell just like escape. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and what's funny about audiobooks is sometimes the narrator also gets it wrong. Like the Witcher audiobooks pronounce oh. dandelion like dandelion. So. <laughs> like it started out saying dandelion, and then later yes. books he started saying dandelion. I was like, is that someone else? Is that a different person? <laughs> what's happening? And then I mean, okay, I cannot. Not... It's not pronounced in the exactly. Polish. Uh, well, it's not. I mean, the name isn't dandelion in Polish. They like translated yeah, it to a different else. name. Oh, that became a fancy horse. <laughs> like, I think it's like a name for a flower, but it's a, I think the flower is buttercup. And so they didn't want to oh. call him buttercup in English because they're like, that doesn't work. <laughs> so they called him dandelion. Because <laughs> that's okay. better. Yeah, dandelion, buttercup. Uh, yeah, I guess because like there's a princess buttercup. Also, like, like, he's I would think of princess so. buttercup, though. A hundred percent. Like, it's a flower, but he's a dude, so... <laughs> I think what this means is we agree with you. Yes. But we also <laughs> like that part sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. like fun. We make it into a game. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, know, I mean, do you want to read a fantasy book where everyone is called like Ashley and Tom? Like, no, it's it's part of the Ashley fun, part of the escapism Tom. when you can't pronounce it. <laughs> All right. Are you ready for this? I like this one. Oh, really dramatic. <laughs> I mean, Look, I'm a dramatic person, so this is, anything it. dramatic is great. I'm right. Like, the drama. I, mean, like, I have like no real drama in my real life. Like I'm boring, <laughs> so I need that drama in my fictional I mean, life. But also, what, you don't want a book to be flat and boring. So right. <laughs> How's this like a negative? It's a positive yeah. if it's dramatic. <laughs> yeah, also, like, I know my real that, life uh, is boring enough. I know Jesse didn't like Empire of Silence, but one of the funniest things in the Sun Eater series is how many times Hadrian is melodramatic about something and he like states something in a dramatic way and other characters are like, why are you so dramatic? Like, are you always like this? And it, all of his friends are like, he is literally always like this. Like, yeah, And he's like, have you met me? Yes. Like, ask my friends. I am literally always like this. I love it. <laughs> I'm excited to read it next week. I'm so excited. Oh yeah. You guys are starting it. Yes. Um. I was going to say, I, I, I think it depends what part of the book 
you don't like being dramatic. Like the one thing I very often get frustrated with with romance is miscommunication and like overly oh, dramatic like fights or arguments around miscommunication. And I mean, so th- you can get like overly dramatic in other genres. I think the fantasy, yeah. I think that's this one's probably referring to like the the ultimate like the quest for <laughs> redemption. I guess and I would want to ask this person if they don't like the situation calling for drama or they don't like characters reacting dramatically to something that doesn't call for it. You know what I mean? Because like yeah. if something is like world ending, I mean that's that's dramatic. You Pretty can't dramatic. not be dramatic about the world ending. But if you're talking about like a little thing and they're being dramatic about it, like that's different. Yeah. You know? Yes. And apparently, um, a very popular book right now that I've been seeing everywhere is Legends and Lattes. It is a cozy fantasy story about... My patrons are making me read that next month. And I was like, but why? (laughs) I think it's about like... I'm excited to see that. Or an orc or something, some creature running a coffee shop. So if you don't like a really dramatic fantasy, you can read it. In my last, so like, because I do vlogs for my patrons with the books they pick for me. And so like last, this last month I did Justice of Kings. uh, They wanted me to read. And at the end of my Justice of Kings vlog, because I already knew they had picked Legends and Lattes, I was like, so like, so next month I was like, I don't know why y'all picked this. Like if you picked this because you're like, she'll like it. Or you picked this because you're like, I want to see her read this. What? (laughs) Why? Why? (laughs) Why? I love it. All right. I think the drama for me comes in like the annoyance in, I guess, like the romance side of it. If it, in like fantasy romance, I guess, specifically, like I can get annoyed if someone is overly dramatic, but that kind of goes to what you said, Jesse, with the, the miscommunication. Like, mm. we have 100 pages of plot that could have been completely done without if we'd have just been like, Hey, I heard this in the hallway. <laughs> like, yeah. let's go on. Those, those old, really old, feel. Those old, yeah, old like YouTube videos. Yourself? There's this old YouTube series where the like, uh, it's like taking like Shakespeare and stuff like that, and be like, all of this could have been avoided if she'd had a sassy gay friend. And it does like <laughs> the same scene where like Juliet's about to kill herself. Spoilers for Romeo and Juliet. And like, <laughs> in comes the friend who's like, what? "What? What? What are you doing?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and she like explains the situation. He's like, "So we kill ourselves, kill yeah. ourselves <laughs> over Romeo." Like, no, <laughs> that love is that. Awesome, I love it. I love right. it. This this is interesting. Personally, I love a chosen one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> a lot of my a done. lot of books I love have a chosen. But one. also, it is not always always yeah. always yeah. a chosen one. Yeah, like, you're just isn't. reading the books that are chosen one for. It's yeah, almost maybe. refreshing nowadays if there is a chosen one because it's so like derided as a thing that you're yeah. like, how like no one dares to actually have a chosen one. <laughs> right. Right. Dude, a chosen yeah. one villain? Now that's something else. Oh. Um, yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, but yeah, I think it depends if you like this trope. There's obviously a lot for you. But if right. you don't like it, there's still a lot. Oh, yeah. You. A lot. Yeah. Grimdark does not tend to have a chosen one. So just read Grimdark. That's true. Joe Abercrombie. Joe Abercrombie. <laughs> always a long journey involved. Mm, I but, don't know. Like... It's not, but it's not true. Just long... like the chosen one. Like it's yeah. not some of them have journeys and, and not all of them do. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I don't love a long journey. I like skipping pa- like get to the point. Like let's, <laughs> if you're gonna have an important conversation on your journey, have it. And then let's go to our destiny. Let's get to the destiny. Are you uh, are you going on Team Alan then, Jesse? Of um <laughs> No, not no, not on Team Allen. Journey before destination. Yeah, yeah. Man, yeah the- <laughs> like just get me to the destination. Point out things that are important, but like I just want the destination. <laughs> yeah, I don't love long journeys. So there's a bunch of fantasy that doesn't have long journeys. There is a bunch. I mean, there's there a bunch a lot that does it well fantasy. too, though. Where it's like it's a journey and it's a long journey, but it does it yeah. like in a kind of rapid fire way, where you're like, you know, that they've had this journey, they've had these conversations. And it makes you feel like you're there, but it doesn't drag it out for 572 pages. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't want it to feel as though the characters are pretty much teleporting all over the world. Right. <clears throat> Wheel of time. Which I do think there's a lot of, um, if you have a one, a single perspective, then it's hard. You have to have a time skip then. But if you have multiple perspectives, then you can be like, well, they're about to journey. So we're going to go talk to some other folks and circle yeah. back to when they have arrived at where they're going. Yeah. <laughs> And then they give yeah. you a little recap when they meet back up. They're like, oh, on our journey. Like, cool, that was a heck of a journey. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I think I like multi-perspective fantasy more than 
Single as soon as something gets boring, we can be like, so we'll check in with you later. Or yeah. here yes. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> I think this one's interesting. Tell that it's fantasy. fantasy. I mean, also, there <laughs> I is mean, low it's magic fantasy. fantasy. There is low magic. I think it's also <clears throat> going back to the conversation about like hard magic and soft magic. So if it's like soft magic, it's not going to be all about the magic. I mean, like Green Bone Saga, it's it like, be. you know, but it's right. not all about it. So you can yeah. still read that now. Um, like, if you don't want to read about magic, you could just read a, like historical fiction or contemporary mm-hmm. book or nonfiction. There are a lot of other yeah. choices out there. Or like or even sci-fi. Fantasy, military fantasy. I don't think that one. Military fantasy is great. Yeah. I think of like um, The Wolf by Leo Carew, which I really enjoyed. Um, that one has like it's just like alternate history. Like yeah, it's like an alternate magic. history, but it's it's it, there's like hardly any magic, if any magic at all, there isn't. and it's really just about like military tactics and like mm-hmm. learning your enemy and like it's just really. Cool. And it's only it's yeah. only fantasy because like the the history of the world did not go that way. So it's right. fantasy because like he's imagining what would the world look like if this had gone that way, but like there isn't any magic. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of like um like she who became the sun. I didn't love it, but. It's more like that historical fantasy. There's like very light paranormal ele- like there's some ghosts in there. But other than that, it is a like military fantasy. And I mean the first law <clears throat> <laughs> also has very little magic. I feel very like I should little, be yeah. keeping like a counter over here. <laughs> yeah. So does so does Grace of Kings. And I thought there was gonna be more magic and there was literally no magic oh. in Grace of Kings. Yeah, so, so see, there's a bunch of fantasy with no magic. If that's mm-hmm. something that you and, um, don't like. Abby's read this. I don't know if anyone else has. And I just read it, like I mentioned, Justice of Kings. And that barely has any magic in mm-hmm. it. Just some necromancy thrown in there. But not, I mean, like, most of this book doesn't really yeah. involve mm-hmm. magic. Yeah. I kind of like reading books with no magic. I, but I like the, like, military war tactics and strategizing and politicking and that sort of thing. Yeah, I like the politics. I think it depends on, like, your expectations going in. Like, I expected there to be some magic in Grace of Kings or, like, some sort of more fantastical elements as opposed to Mm -hmm. being solely history. And so when I was just getting the history, I was like, but where's the magic? Where's the rest? But then once you adjust your expectations, it's I still liked the book. But I think it's knowing what you're getting yourself in for. Mm-hmm. That's how I felt about She Who Became the Sun. And I feel like that was more of a marketing issue. Like, they market mm-hmm. it as, like, comparing it to, like, the Poppy War and, like, mm-hmm. Song of Achilles and, um, like, Mulan with fantasy. And you're like, okay, I'm expecting lots of magic. And there was, like, none. But it's not but even it was like still not bad. It was just a marketing issue. <laughs> it's not even like it's really obscure to like have to dig to find fantasies <clears throat> that don't have a lot of magic. Like extremely popular, well known series are low magic. The Song of Ice and Fire, low magic. Mm-hmm. Gentlemen Bastards, low magic. First Law, low magic. Like you don't. It's not like oh, the big ones all have magic. You have to go find some obscure one mm-hmm. that has low magic. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say, I was just about to bring up Game of Thrones, The Song of Ice and Fire. I think that that's why the TV show was as successful as mm-hmm. it was was because you didn't have to rely on like special effects making magic look cool because like at the end of the day that's not what that series is about and that's at. also why there's people that think that game of thrones is a history show you're like <laughs> no! there are dragons though <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's like, dragons. <clears throat> our education system like okay what, <laughs> what part of your european history class were there Targaryens? <laughs> and three giant dragons, yeah. Yeah. yeah That's totally. like what I love about that show is it was much more about the politicking of the houses for, for well, power. Well, the books are that and way too. That, that's, I think, why that was so successful. Well, when we were talking about like um, the other assumption about it being like too many names to keep track of, like the reading mm-hmm. Fire and Blood right now, which is the like prequel history of the Targaryens conquering it, like it is like drinking names out of a fire hose. I was like... <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to kind of, we've done a lot of like world building, magic, that sort of thing. I'm going to kind of shift gears here because there was a lot around characters. So let's chat this assumption. Most of no! the MCs are, Mary are Mary Sue's. I feel like we've really gotten away from that. And I know like a lot of my favorites like the chosen right one. now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even a lot of my favorite ones right now literally have, like, the opposite of that. Like, Queen of Blood mm-hmm. has literally the opposite of, like, a Gary Sue kind of trope. And mm-hmm. also no chosen one. So, 
it's fantastic for both of those. I feel like these go hand in hand. Like a chosen one is usually a Mary Sue and a Mary Sue yeah. is usually a chosen one. So like mm-hmm. they just, you know, it, everyone makes fun of it so much that like literally no one does it anymore. So like, right. if you do have it, you're like, wow, this one has a chosen one Mary Sue. How unique. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, they're getting away from that <clears throat> a lot. Yeah. I, I And I think, like, there are ways to do the Chosen One without making them a total Mary Sue. Like, oh, yeah. I always think of, like, Katniss as being, like, a really great character because she had, like, strengths. But she had a lot of weaknesses where she had to rely on the people around <laughs> her to help her. And, like, so even, like... I think of like Katniss kind of like the chosen one in the <laughs> series, right? But yeah, she but I, do was, think, I thought she was a good character. I think people too, um, like readily and too broadly apply the def- like uh, the title Mary Sue and Gary Stu mm-hmm. to anyone that's just like very talented and exceptional. Because like, of course, you're going to tell your story about somebody who's worth <clears throat> telling a story about. That <laughs> means they're like, oh, it's so unlikely that they survived this war. Yeah, well, you don't tell the war story about the guy that died on day one, because like, there goes yeah. your story. So like, you do <laughs> tell the exceptional story of the guy that against all odds survived, just right. like you tell the story about the guy who like, like, we remember Albert Einstein because he was a Mary Sue of science. Like, he just <laughs> was so genius but like that's why he's interesting to learn about you don't have a story about i mean you can like it's like a subversion of that like um i don't know if anyone's ever seen the movie inside uh lewin davis but it's like about the the idea of like we hear about bob dylan and we hear about the artists that like you know were discovered and became big but there was a bunch that didn't so what if we do like a week in a life about one of the ones that like kind of almost borderline made it so many times but like didn't because he messed up and like <laughs> it's very sad <laughs> so like, you can do that but like most of the time you're telling the story about the guy who or the girl or the person or the entity who is exceptional that's why there's a story <laughs> right <laughs> yeah and um i think that just for folks who don't know what a Gary Stu or Mary Sue is, it's essentially a character who excels at everything they try, even when they have no experience with such thing. Like the most <laughs> classic example is yeah. Ray from the new Star Wars trilogy. Oh yeah. With no training in anything yet excels at piloting. <laughs> and usually a uh, Mary Sue or Gary Stu also like everyone around them, like loves them for like yeah. no apparent reason. And like everything works for them. And like, they're yeah. always in the right. And like, yeah. they're just like too perfect to live. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. So that's, just a definition but I think another one that I commonly see referred to as a Gary Stew would be uh Kaladin from the Stormlight Archive no I know we have the Stormlight Archive theater <laughs> but I wouldn't have called him a Gary Stew I wouldn't have, but, yeah and I think that a lot of times Gary Stews or Mary Stews get associated to characters who have immense like physical strength versus mm. like having to deal with like mental uh not weakness, but like they have just maybe some mental health issues that they're also working through, but they might have a very strong power or something. So like the that. Hulk is a Gary Stu. <laughs> yeah. That, it, it, <laughs> up, with that logic. The whole with that story. logic. Yeah. <laughs> but I, that's where I often see uh, those types of labels get associated with like characters who have immense, like physical strength where yeah. I think that there's a lot of, nuances that could be behind the physical strength that they're struggling well, with well you're talking about magic systems and limitations <clears throat> on them and soft versus hard magic i feel like gary stew is often pop up or like people get pissed about a gary stew if it's also a soft magic system mm-hmm. or like uh they seem to just be like better at the magic all the time than everybody else in inexplicable ways and you don't really know what the limits of this are mm-hmm. there seem to be no limits they're just like overpowered all the time for no mm-hmm. like or again like ray in star wars we were like I thought we kind of had some limits on this wibbly wobbly force thing, but like she just broke those limits <laughs> utterly with like no reason. <laughs> so you're like, right. okay. Yes. And I can get that that is frustrating because it is really frustrating when someone's just good at everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> right. You want flawed. Which is why I like that Quoth is <clears throat> pisses everyone off. Like that's the part of a Gary Stu that he's not because like people have to like every, like a Gary Stu. Yeah, or a Gary you have to Stu, like him. And he just pisses everybody off with like being a smart ass all the time and be like, I'm actually like low key good at this the first time I try it. And they're like, go away. No one likes you. <gasps> Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Everyone is in love with the one chick 
everyone has a mate, <laughs> things always work out. I feel like there's a specific that series. That's for a very yeah. specific book. That's not fantasy. That's like for romance. Yeah, fantasy, romance, romance, romance. Romance. Yeah. fantasy romance. Fantasy yeah. romance. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely I fantasy mean, romance where that might be true. <laughs> a lot do you find it frustrating? Genre. It's yeah, like that's that that frustrating. The everyone has a mate. I'm like, can we stop pairing everybody up? Like, why does <laughs> yeah. everybody have to be in a couple? Yeah. yeah, I don't read a whole lot of fantasy romance, but like, I don't like the mated trope. Like, I don't like that faded, mated. It's just not. And then things always work out. I mean, I guess in like fantasy romance, like technically to be romance in general, it has to have a happy ending. Yeah. Like it has a happily ever after, so like that makes sense. But in in a lot of fantasy books uh, that are not <laughs> romance, things always working out. Mm-mm. Well, I feel like yeah. tragic endings. I feel like from a narrative interest perspective, like something being faded and mated, it takes away all dramatic tension because, like, well, you're mated, so it's no you're really or well. Together. And like one of my favorite like quotes from Oscar Wilde is like, "Uncertainty is the essence of romance." Because and there's no uncertainty. <laughs> You're fated yeah. mate. So like, well, I guess that's a done deal. <laughs> that's true. But I do know a lot of people who like that fated trope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's all to, like your preference. Right? Well, the thing that like drives me nuts. It drives some... me nuts when like it tries to have its cake and eat it too. Because again, like to make it romantic, there has to be uncertainty. But they want to make them fated mates. So there's like some contrived reason why the fatedness of it is like in question. Mm. And they're like, we we're fated. But we don't know we're fated. So we are questioning our fatedness. So it's still uncertain, guys. Like, we're, it's obviously guaranteed to have in the cosmos of determined. But we're like still unsure if the cosmos oh, yeah. had it right. <laughs> my favorite thing about it is the build up to it. That is my favorite thing about yeah. it. Yeah. So as long as it's done well, then yes, I like the trope. If not. Yeah. And I will say, like, I think with the the mate trope, you would have to have conflict outside of the relationship. Yeah. Like that's where it would get interesting. Cause like mm-hmm. Leanna, you were saying like, okay, they're fa- fated to be together. Like there's no question. So it has to be conflict outside of them that is forcing them apart or forcing them to make decisions or something like that. That's what where it could get interesting, so. Again, I want it to be dramatic as possible. Yeah. <laughs> no fantasy is dramatic. All the drama. <laughs> Give it to us. Give All us right, the this drama. is interesting. It's all medieval dudes questing for like what? <gasps> what? Hot Incorrect. Saving mythical creatures. Okay. Was um, this Shrek? <laughs> yeah. Like, have we read City of Brass? Have we read Poppy War? Have we read, Poppy <laughs> have we War? read the fifth season? Have we, yeah, the fifth. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Anything, Jim, is like I we can go on, yeah. Although, I like the idea for anyone who's read the first law that we have a medieval dude, Logan, questing for a hot blonde, Giselle. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome, I love it. Giselle, Giselle is the best and the worst. He's a hot blonde, so it checks out. (laughs) I love him. Oh, it's so so funny. I feel like this is a really common conception though like this is something that a lot of people who don't read fantasy think because they they think of the classic like lord of the rings which really wouldn't be medieval but like they think of that and then like where's the hot blonde in legolas duh i mean oh my gosh yeah i don't this, this one... feels like shrek like it just sounds sounds like like a fairy tale not fantasy and i think we've conflated those two yeah i'm gonna i'm not gonna lie i don't think i've ever read a fantasy book that has this (laughs) so yes um but maybe there's some out there who knows maybe they're like the older (laughs) if anyone knows let us know in the comments like yeah They either have a fairy or a dragon or some other sentient creature. Like, honestly, not that often. Not there's not actually enough dragons. And and even the books that have dragons on the actual dragons on the cover, they don't actually have a dragon in them, and it's really disappointing. Especially (laughs) one scene with a dragon. (laughs) I'm not (laughs) sure about it at all. I've also found that like it's even though I'm always like, ooh, dragons. Ninety nine percent of the time, if I'm reading a book that has actually dragons in it, I'm not talking about when it's like it's on the title and it's not in it, like actually has dragons in it. 99% of the time, I actually don't like like how they're written. Like I don't like 
books that actually I'm like, I in theory, I'm like, ooh, dragons. And then it happens. And I'm like, I don't like that though. Like, that's dumb. <laughs> I know it's kind of hard to pull off. Yeah. But yeah, I, I have not read enough fantasy books with dragons and I've read a lot. So I feel like we need more dragons. We need more dragons. Well executed. There is I a lot of a... fey, but like that's in a very specific like, yeah, subgenre. Like... I think dragons also fall into that category of like no one does chosen ones, no one does Mary Sue's, no one does dragons because everyone's like, oh, that's so cliche. But it's it's to the point where like it's rare to find <laughs> it if you actually write a story with a chosen one and a quest and a, and a dragon. maiden and a dragon. Like that would be like a unique entry <laughs> into the fantasy. <laughs> yeah, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like what, what I'm seeing is like book talk. I don't know book talk. I'm like so far removed from that realm. But I feel like book talk is getting a lot of people to pick up fantasy. But the yeah. starting point is like a Court of Thorns and Roses. Yeah. It's like, yes, <laughs> that is fantasy. But it is not all encompassing of like, this is what fantasy represents. Like yeah. it is not like even I was saying like don't start with that. <laughs> yeah, right. like, I, I haven't seen this like see, or some other sentient creature. Are you saying you don't want animal companions That's in your books? Love. Yeah, I like, love an animal companion because because I thought every everyone should in theory like an animal companion. In their <laughs> Except Alan. Yeah, unless he's like, like Alan. everyone in theory. Alan loves this. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, so I feel like it's all dependent on your preference, as with all of these assumptions. Right. <laughs> all right, this one, there's a lot of misogynistic oh. white men writing it, and not much diversity. Have it's you like read? getting better. Like, like, I mean, like, yeah. if you look at fantasy lot. from the 80s, 90s, 50s, like, how many years ago, then yes, it was predominantly white men writing it. But yeah. if you're picking up books published in the 2010s, 2020s, then there are a lot more diverse authors. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the, the, definitely the, becoming a lot more diverse. Like you wouldn't yeah. have had a yeah. a fantasy centered around Asian mythology coming out 50 years ago. I don't But think. also not every white man writing fantasy was a misogynist even back 50 years ago. Like True. the assumption right. that a white man wrote yeah. is therefore this book is misogynistic, like sometimes, but like not all the time. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's like a certain standard we have now where like, if that's in there, like it's going to get called out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So like we have a standard because I'm reading um, the Legends of the First Empire series by Michael J. Sullivan, and he has some of the best female characters, like my favorite female characters in fantasy. And a lot of it, his wife helps him write a lot of the, oh. the aspects of them. Um, so she has a lot of like input. But he does it so well. So it's like even like Leanna, to your point, even if it is a white man, like there's a first there's law. It's great. We recognize not doing it well. Like it's Six. probably gonna get called out. I've got a running doing it well, Like it's awesome. So yeah, I think that this has gotten a lot better. Yeah, 100%. read Jemison. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Yeah, read Poppy War, read like City of Back City of Brass. City of yeah, Brass. Green Bone. Nightingale. Green Bone. Octavery Butler. Octa yeah. Butler. Yeah. There's a lot. MC is an orphan. <laughs> okay, so that I think is Alan big. submitted this. Yeah. That is big in YA fantasy though, specifically. <laughs> it, is YA. it is very I YA. And I get it away. annoys me as well. For reasons. But it makes sense because it's like, okay, these are a bunch of like 16 year olds going on quests. Like, is their mom yeah, going to come along is. with them? I would read that though. Like I would read mom coming along on the quest and like, but like the whole thing is to get them on their own. Right. Yeah. So it, it kind of is like a necessary evil. I don't this see this as much an adult a, fantasy. Mm -mm. This reminds me of a post that was about six of crows which like made me laugh because <laughs> six of crows is you know like teenagers yeah um so it was so it obviously reading adults. six of crows so obviously reading six of crows um from the crows perspective it feels like the characters are more adult than teen and so shockingly mature for their age which i'm sure they are because you know trauma 
but do you ever wonder if we had gotten a chapter from Colm's perspective he's an adult? Like, is a teenager with a limp cane and rough smoker voice really cool, or does Kaz look like a weird Hot Topic kid? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Probably Hot Topic kid. Probably Hot Topic kid. Probably. That's hilarious. That yeah, like, great. where are the parents? Where is your mom? <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is definitely more of a thing in, like, middle grade and mm -hmm. YA, because it, like Jesse was saying, like, it's kind of the necessary evil to, like, get the characters moving, but, like, not as much as old. I don't, I don't often read that. And in but fact, I feel like chosen ones are often orphans because that's why they don't know who they are who they or are. like why they're special. <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, when I read a fantasy that has amazing mothers, Jesse, I know that you agree. Yep. I'm like, yay! I know. Again. Yes. <laughs> like, it gets you excited. It's so exciting. You're like, when they're yes, not terrible people or dead. <laughs> so fun. Um, Okay, this one, this one's funny. Do fan fiction ask? I don't know because I don't. What is it fan fiction of? What is it fan fiction of? Yeah. Although so like, I don't really a know. certain Fay writing author does sound like she's writing fan fiction of her own works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot, but that's not even just fantasy. Like a lot of authors, didn't they get their start as fanfic yeah. writers? Like change names, like maybe, and then yeah. publish I that book. And I mean, quite a few contemporary books are like fan fiction of Twilight, so... Oh, yeah. What? Fifty Eights, right? Well, and Twilight was fan fiction of Wuthering Heights. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Was it really? Was I didn't it? Even know that. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, I feel like this is like directly Probably. calling out Rule of Wolves. <laughs> and part of me questions like, so there's fan fiction, but then there's also like fairy tale retellings, and they're sort of like the same thing yeah. in a way. That's true. Yeah, I've never really thought about it that way. Well, about I feel like fan fiction esque is like a derisive, mean way to say mm -hmm. that like you're influenced by previous works and like paying mm -hmm. homage to them, which is an absolutely fine thing to do. That like for hundreds and hundreds of years since the written word has existed, people have like been inspired by what came before. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think yeah. it's like a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, Tolkien was writing fan fiction of like Norse sagas and like old myths because that's what he was a big fan of. So he was like, what if I did like my own version of that? Yeah, that is true. Yeah, and I like when um, an author can take something that you think you know, like like a chosen one trope or like a prophecy trope or something like that and like flips it on its head in a really unique way that you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So they might be taking a lot of inspiration, but they're making it completely new because of their own voice, their own spin on it. So, yeah. All right. We have like one more <laughs> that I think is a good one to end on. And it's, I won't ever be able to relate to the characters. Oh. Then you lack empathy. But why? <laughs> well, or is it I think that's my first, but, but why? No, is it that you don't see yourself in the characters? Like you don't feel like you're represented by characters or is it the or is it because like the situations they're in are too far fetched from your yeah. reality like you i've can't... never ridden a horse and carried a sword i don't understand this life yeah <laughs> that's like, my two sides to that like yeah on, yeah that's what i took this as was like because they're in these situations that we ourselves would never be in like how to relate to that yeah but i mean i have a hard time with that because like okay like one of my favorites is sword of kaigen and obviously our main character is a mom and I related to her so much on like different levels of like, okay, she's a mom that didn't really want to be a mom. And she's like longing for her past life and trying to balance that, you know, that past life with her present and feeling like she's terrible because she's like, I don't know if I really want this. Like, mm -hmm. and granted it's in a fantastical magical war setting, mm -hmm. but you get that underlying, like, okay, <clears throat> this really relates to like, well, I mean, you to know, this person, I would people. say, like, does that mean you can't read anything outside of contemporary written about your place in time and mm -hmm. about, like, your specific age and your specific gender and your, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, can you not take yourself out of your own experience and try to ask what if I yeah. was in a different experience? Yeah. Like, I think of, like, the Poppy War, right? Because I love the Poppy War, that <laughs> first book. And... I would never be in Rin's situation, luckily. Like, thank no. goodness. I'm fortunate <laughs> enough to, like, never be in that situation. But R.F. Kuang wrote those situations to, like, evoke such emotion from me. Like, she – and I think that that's the difference. Because I've read fantasy where I'm like, I don't 
these characters are not connecting or whatever the case yeah. may be. I've read fantasy with characters in completely like crazy situations I would never find myself in. But if they can execute on like getting you to really feel like what they're feeling and like really like get you in their shoes, I think that that's a really good writer who mm -hmm. executes on even if you're in a fantasy world. And I mean, like, this is not just fantasy. Because, like, I have as much in yeah. common with the main characters in Of Mice and Men as I do with the characters <laughs> in First Law. Like, That's true. <laughs> yeah, it's not just fantasy that this is relating to. It's, like, any book outside of your own experience. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think there are, like, yeah. as fantasies become more diverse and has grown as a genre, that you are getting characters that are more and more diverse and different, that... You don't just have white, straight main characters anymore. You have characters of various races and religious backgrounds and um, LGBTQIA plus characters. Like you have loads of different characters in different stories. So I think you should be able to find somewhere a character that you can see yourself in. Yeah, yeah. On the flip side, if you're if that this was related to like not feeling like you're represented, mm -hmm. then there's so much coming out and that they're now. Yeah, for sure. So that was like the last assumption. Um, I think kind of like the moral of the story is that there's fantasy for everyone. <laughs> yeah. I think that's I why mean, they're assumptions. It's people who have not read fantasy and are like, yeah. oh, it's just anything that has a dragon and a quest. And they're like, I mean, a dragon <laughs> and a quest would make it fantasy. It would. But, <laughs> but I actually don't read a ton, a ton of those, to be honest. I, yeah. I really no. fantasy. I, I would say that's like, the the least popular uh tropes to go with now are the the quest well, the like, i saw a track. video that was talking about how every single new robin hood movie that comes out is some kind of like a twist on or subversion of robin hood and you're like when's the last time there was an actual robin hood movie for because like if you don't actually have in mind an actual robin hood then what are you subverting like they're all just twists on it. And you're like, twists on what though? Like I uh, haven't actually done a normal Robin Hood for us to be like, so that's Robin Hood. Now what right. if we subverted that? No, it's all just subversions. And you're like, how about just do Robin Hood? Just do Robin Hood. <laughs> but the Fox Disney Robin Hood movie is superior. Still a subversion because Robin <laughs> yeah. Hood was not a fox. <laughs> I, mean, men I mean, he was tights. a fox, but he wasn't but a fox. <laughs> men in tights, best Robin Hood, men in tights. Oh, I love the Disney movie. I think uh, we're just fortunate now to live in a time where we have so much different types of fantasy that can just accommodate to any other, like any reader now. Yeah. And it's really cool. And I think is. there's a fantasy book out there for anyone who wants to try. I mean, not my food. mom, but everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And That's like, like all series, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's why she can't start any. Mm -hmm. I somehow don't think that Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell would do better with her. Mm. Um. That's a brick yeah, that's a, that's, of a That butt. one is very intimidating. To me. Yeah. It's not a series, though. It's not a series. <laughs> All right. Well, any other last minute thoughts? It's yeah. Fantasy for everybody. making assumptions and go read a fantasy yeah, book. Go read yeah. it. <laughs> think about it. Read it. Do it. Try it. We dare you. <laughs> you don't even have to spend your money there's libraries yeah exactly yeah. well thank you all so much for joining for this assumptions video and we're very curious to hear what you think of this down below what do you think some assumptions are maybe that weren't brought up um, and what would your response to them be so leave those comments down below we love chatting with you and again go check out the merchandise watch our Holy ads <laughs> yep and uh we will see you in the next video Bye, everyone. Bye.